able to turn this part of the service to one of my very dearest, dearest friends, my ally, a man that I have ultimate confidence in. I could not turn it over to a person whom I love anymore, whom I respect anymore, or whom I believe in anymore. This is a great man of God, and he's going to share with us the word of God. Would you greet Brother Ferris? I know you love him. Greet him this morning. Thank you. Beautiful words. I hope I can live up to those. Let me uh, say this about uh, our debt elimination program we started a few weeks ago. Uh, <clears throat> I remember giving my first seed in on that. And, of course, this is a seed because he, yes, uh, it's above your tie. And it's a gift that we give unto the Lord. And I remember I, I gave uh, my first, I guess you'd say, seed on this a few weeks just right after starting this. And her daughter had been sick for a few weeks. She'd had a, uh, the doctor said it was a bladder infection. And so she had just kept, Without being on strong antibiotics, it was just getting worse. Her pain was getting worse and worse, it seemed like, and she was getting no better. So I had been praying about it and asked for prayer, two or three different people. And to make a long story short, I remembered I gave my first offering or gift on this debt elimination program that we have started here at the Church of Joy. Now, she's gone in this few weeks to three different doctors, and they've all misdiagnosed her, treating her for a, a, a bladder infection, and she's in a lot of pain. So I uh, went to God this way, and I said, allow that seed to be a seed for her healing. And so she's scheduled on a Monday to go see a specialist. They've done spent hundreds over their deductible, their insurance deductible and all that, going to the doctors and the medication and all this, and she was growing worse. So I, I begin to say, God, just allow my, that seed to be a harvest of her healing. And that Sunday, my wife was telling me that as she went through the house, the pain hit her so bad that she was driven to her knees and she said, I am sick and tired of being sick. And she said, something moved. I think about the scripture there in Matthew. It says, since the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, but the violence take it by force. The enemy has been out to destroy you and all of God's children. And when she immediately fell to her knees and addressed God in that way and let the devil know it, she said, Mama, something moved and I felt good and I, she got up not only praising God but she canceled her uh, she had a next day which was Monday appointment to visit a specialist and she had two kidney stones and they moved the doctors missed it that's why it's so important that we go to her physician and what's his name I'm sorry I forgot bell tone what did you say his name Amen and amen. Listen, this morning, God's dealt with us in the last few days to speak to you about worship. And it's not to feed you or cram into you a lot of information, but it's something that will also produce from that information that is put into your spiritual mind, your new born-again nature mind, but that spiritual information that is transferred from the written Word of God into the tablets of your heart, it will begin to inspire that word of that, that measure of faith in you, and it will be increased, and you'll have a revelation. That's like uh, sometime back uh, last season or last year, we ministered on fellowship, relationship and partnership with God. Well, this would be like an additional part to that, and it's on true worship. And we're going to go to John 4, 
chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 23, and I'm thinking about that word there. It says, but the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now, the revelation that we need in this informational scripture or verse here, God is dealing with the Samaritan lady who he told his disciples earlier that he must go to Samaria, but yet his disciples could not understand God was going to bring a, a miracle and a revival to that city through a little lady who you might say, and I, I've got a note here where she was, you know, she had five husbands, but the one she was living with really wasn't her husband. But God is going to produce in her and plant a seed and that is for the church to be birthed in us, especially in this year of 2011, that we would have a revelation on how to worship God in spirit and in truth. I'm talking about an intimate relationship with God where that we come out of carnality and we walk in the spirit realm and we begin to worship him as spirit beings. He, we was made, Genesis says, in his image and his likeness, but it's time we begin to act like the church children of God and the things that, the, that you don't realize when you get in deep concentration with God and deep meditation and worship that the walls of darkness that the enemy has brung up around you and led you into bondage and in captivity through sickness, diseases and tribulation they'll begin to crumble down because you're inviting a manifestation of the supernatural power of God in your life because you're coming in in one man and one accord with the will of God and God is transferring a tangible transferring uh, anointing into your life because you've invited invited God to inhabit the praises of his people. Give God praise this morning. You know, God wants us. He's a spirit, and he wants us to learn how to worship him in spirit and truth. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, For the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That means Freedom. Freedom in the Holy Ghost. Free to, to receive and walk into your blessings through your blood covenant relationship. Freedom. If you study the old scriptures, you'll find out that when a small, weak nation was facing a major battle, maybe with a stronger nation, a, a, a much severe in, in, in the army, army tree, you might say that they are, they're just soldiers, and maybe they're not then they would join in covenant relationship with someone who would protect them and somebody who would deliver them. We are in covenant with the Almighty God and God expects us to be able to use and draw from His power because we know our position in Him as His offspring, as His children, but we refer back to carnality and five physical senses and reasoning rather than realize we're made in His image, created in His likeness. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore in liberty, for with Christ the anointed word and the word made flesh and the word that is coming into your temple and your house, it makes us free that we will no longer be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And there's some folk here today that needs to be set free. You need to be set free. And it's, the enemy snares and brings us in captivity in the carnal mind because we try to figure out things. Honey, you can't figure it out, but God did 2,000 years ago and God paid the price if we could only walk in the authority of his word and in the power of his covenant relationship unto us. You could have peace. You could have victory. You can have liberty. You can have freedom. Arthritis can no longer hold you down. Uh, 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 a bad disc. I know... Uh, Fourteen years ago, I think I started going to my neighbor who was a chiropractor at that time. And he said, after a few years I went, he said, you know, you need to find another occupation. And after a while, he said, if you want to uh, uh, maybe sign up on your disability or something like that, I said, I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll fill out the paper. He said, you're 40% disabled, so I got me another chiropractor. <laughs> I didn't want to be disabled because I knew who my father was. 
my lineage. I traced it back. He's a healer. He's a redeemer. The same three doctors that missed the diagnosis of my daughter might miss mine. May, they may try to do a, a brain implant. You know, I got the cavity there. All they got to do is just implant one. But I didn't want to trust doctors. I wanted to trust God. And you know, this week, uh, uh, my nephew told me, said, I'm going to sell a farm. I need some trees cut. Well, I went down there, didn't think a thing about it, and cut those trees, made it fine. After I switched doctors, bad info. That's what's happening to us a lot of times. We're getting bad information. And we can, will not produce in revelation because you're not going to the written word of God. You're not obedient unto God because, you know, God does inhabit the praises of his people. Now, instead of being in bondage, if we could just learn how to serve him, how to worship him, not in flesh anymore, not by re religious teachings, not by traditions, not having a form of godliness, but yet denying the power thereof, I'm talking about with when we raise our hands and we lift up in our hearts and we begin to say unto God, as we lift our hands, what does that mean? You saw enough uh, war programs and, and stuff like this that if you're overwhelmed by the enemy and you want to give up and quit, you just lift your hands or a white flag or something and you say, I surrender, I quit, and you're taking into, you might say, in that encampment or environment of, of the, uh, if you was in battle of your enemy or something like that. Uh, uh, but God is, we're saying to God, when we raise our hands, we're saying, God, I surrender all to you. But so many times we're holding back 90% because we're afraid of what our neighbor might think. We're afraid to lift our hands. We're afraid to exalt God. We're afraid to feel that what he told that little white little Samaritan lady she would receive. She came in the latter hour of the day to re get water for her household so she wouldn't be seen because she was a Samaritan, a half-breed, so to speak, half-Gentile, half-Jew. But he said, if you'd ask of me, now she come to get water to sustain her family. He said, if you'd ask of me, I'd give you water, living water, that would flow out of your belly, in other words, out of your spirit, and you would never thirst again, because John also teaches a little later on, on the 14th, 15th chapter of this book, he tells us that the Holy Ghost would begin to service out of your spirit an engulfing or a baptism of your spirit with his anointing and he would begin to flow through you and he'll begin to bypass. James says the hardest member of this old body to contain is the tongue. He'll begin to take charge of that old unruly tongue, your tongue of English, and he'll begin to transform and change that natural language into a Holy Ghost language that only God can understand. Amen. You know, I think about a couple of places in the Old Testament where that men really had worship and fellowship. And I often, especially in ministering, I think about whenever Adam was created and the pleasure, the word there in that John 4.23, that I pray that you get a revelation of is seek. God seeks such to worship. Now, here in Genesis, God is coming down in the cool of the day before Adam transgresses and sins and falls into sin and captivity of that bondage of sin. But this is what, under the anointing on occasions, I see the interest intimacy that God wants. He so treasured that time with Adam that he had created the animals and he had bring them before Adam. He thought so much of Adam that he had him to name and give Adam dominion over all the animals, the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air. And can't you see back then if there was dinosaurs or behemoths in that, he brung it before Adam and Adam said, I think I'll call that one Rex. He growls a lot. No, I'm going to transfer his name. I think I'll call him Dino because he acts like a little puppy dog when I'm around. 
Fred and Barney was probably on his mind. No, he said, I, I think about the children and I want to be much friendlier than that. I'll just call him Barney. They were so subject to him, it was like cartoons to God. But the thing that God treasured and we so miss because we walk carnally was God was wanting an intimate relationship with Adam and Eve. And then the next one I think about was David. Remember just a short time ago, pastor was preaching to us about when David was bringing the ark back into the capital, you might say. Every few feet, he would stop. Every few steps, he would make, I should say, journey just a few feet. He would stop. He would uh, begin to dance before the Lord. He would begin to give him sacrifices of his praise and sacrificing of animals uh, 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 to, for a sin offering and really begin to worship God. And when he got real serious with his worship, he began to undress out of the kingly role and revert back to being just a young lad once again whenever the prophet had anointed him. And he, as a small boy, once again, he began to just worship God, no longer as a king. And when he came out of that realm of a king, Saul's daughter, his wife, began to make fun of him when he gets home. Look at you out there all undignified, dancing before the Lord without any clothes on, dancing before your people. And because of that, she mocked the worship of God, and that's very dangerous. She remained barren all her life. She never gave an heir, a birth to an heir to the throne. So you don't know how important it is to worship nor when we become so religiously minded or so dignified of what others may think, you can lose out on your blessing. Not, you know, God just won't just lip service. But in James, God says, uh, you know, man is, is, can become double-minded. So he says, you just draw nigh to God, resisting the enemy and the implantations of thoughts that the, the uh, carnality may be having. And you begin to, Learn how to exalt him with maybe I love to raise my hands under submission and begin to exalt him and waiting upon him as I worship him and saying, God, I want you to be in control of my life. And I'm talking about being able to feel the presence of God when you worship. No longer is flesh up on the throne of the heart or in this temple, but we place God there. Remember that verse, or 23? In chapter 4, Tr God seeks such to truly worship Him. God is revealing unto us His very nature, His very heart, and He wants an intimate relationship with God. I'm talking about the creator of heaven and earth and the entire universe. He treasures free will worship from the heart. Not from her lips, but from her heart. Sure, he wants the sacrifices of her praises. And they are that at times. Like with Pastor Lo, I saw him up here so many times. Uh, maybe he would be in pain. He would be hurting. Maybe he might have had a good week. But he'd get up here and he'd leap for joy. He would make a physical effort and he leads the flock. But he's having a hard time getting the flock to follow. What's well, good evangelistic work, isn't it? We don't demonstrate or father the pattern that was set before us. He pushes in every service so hard for us to worship because he wants you to have a very intimate relationship with God. You know, I love to pray. But you know, God doesn't fancy a lot of times if we pray or, or bring our petitions to him in the intellectual way with words that are highly dignified, that are beautiful. But what he really loves when we bring our prayers or petition, and God, there's one thing that God does honor above prayer. Because God is not touched by our pain and the crisis of life, 
but he is, as the little lady was with the issue of blood, he is touched when we push through that pain, through that crisis of life, through that tribulation, and we by faith say in our mind, if I can but just touch the hem of the master's garment, in this day and hour in which we live in 2011, the only way you can really touch God is by your worship. Because God will accept that as sacrifices of your lips. You know, carnality in religious folks, we, they, 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 they would both would like for us to act all dignified. And yet, in the eyes of God, that stinks in his nostrils. He, he, who cares what people think? But yet we are so transformed to that, we, we are reluctant to speak. And I remember in the second grade talking about speaking. I was called out of a little school, taken to a, a group of specialists to determine if my speech problem, a pronunciation of certain words, would ever get better. Maybe I'd need to go to a special school uh, because I had a speech defect in certain areas, certain words. So from then on, that planted such a, a, a tremendous, horrible seed in my life. It brought about a curse. And all through school, you know, I, I'd, rather than stand up and give a verbal report, I, I'd take an elf because I would not stand up because I'd afraid I'd get made fun of. I remember going to a friend's house at an early age, probably 12 or so, and she said, you're not good as these other boys and stuff. I always put down. And now I remember a lady minister called me out one time, and she spoke to that curse that man had put in my life. She said, Moses couldn't talk clearly. Moses was given Aaron. I don't know what your limitations is in God. That was one that we had to overcome, and God called us into the ministry. And I said, God, I, I, I've just studied your book for a few weeks and months, and I said, you know, in here you've never made a mistake. Uh, uh, you don't think maybe you're making number one by calling us into the ministry. And he said, I don't think so. I know I'm not. So, you know, you, you might, we have that negative input by worldly and by being politically correct. And in the world today, you, you go around and all you hear, especially if you listen to the uh, four or five major news network, networks, all is programmed in you is negativity. And then we wonder why, you know, the Bible says we're snared by the words of our mouth and the words of our mouth create our harvest and we wonder why we're having the harvest that we have and those words originated from our thoughts because we don't realize that what we're trying to do to you today is to put on a renewed mind which come by the regeneration of the life that as Jesus was talking to a little lady a, a, a Samaritan lady about a, a, a well of living water that's what will be produced in you by the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the saturation of the word of God in you you'll get a revelation uh, uh, that you are the light and you are the salt. Salt is a preservative and a seasoning and God puts us in the world as heirs of his and you are a seasoning. You are a, a, a preservative that is to preserve until he comes but the most important thing is you are a light. That means out of your belly can come the illumination truth by the anointing of God that you can speak a word which is uh, comes from the written word but it becomes a rhema word in due season and you can water somebody's seed and cause them to have a harvest because you're an heir of salvation and the angels they can't understand why we get so excited in worship when we get so excited because they a, a host of those was created for that reason but God loves it when those that are heirs of salvation come before him and out of a free will, they worship him in spirit and in truth because they are having that revelation or wanting to have that revelation. You know, God, here's her prayer, but God doesn't respond so much to that. I think about Paul and Silas when they're in jail or in prison, beaten at the midnight hour or prior to that, but they're at midnight. Now, they, they, was, they could have had a great pity party. I mean, they was a candidate for a pity party, uh, but they don't, they don't have a pity party. They've been beaten. They've been ridiculed for ministering the gospel. But they begin to worship. 
they began to exalt hands and sing songs and the prison doors was opened up to them because they touched God and the fellowship of the worship came back to them in the form of a miracle. And so many times we're saying, God, we may come up for prayer or something and we're so frigid and so cold and we're saying, God, do something. God's saying, I'm, I'm doing exactly what you're doing. That's nothing. We, we stand here. And we, we, no, you've got to get the ball to rolling because you've got to get some sacrifice of praise. You've got to begin to praise him. You've got to begin to exalt him and say, this uh, limitation. I can remember years ago, uh, one of the last tracks of timber I, I cut, well, no, it was it was probably two or three. Before that, a year or so, I remember falling through a treetop, and I had my chainsaw running. We, we was having, I was probably up eight or ten foot high, and uh, that saw had been revved up. That's all I remember is I'd stepped out there, and it was stupidity on my part. And, that we'd done broke a break and choker after choker. I was 15, 16, uh, and the main cable's 125. We just kept popping dollars. So I walked out there over a valley, a little ditch line, and I topped that tree and I fell about eight feet and I was trying to hold that saw, which the chain hadn't quit turning. I didn't get further enough to trip the brake on it. And uh, so I grabbed a limb and when I did, I was in excruciating pain as Pastor Lowe is, probably to a degree, because I pulled my arm out of socket. Well, I didn't know what to do. I checked and everything, you know, and I I was hurting it severely. And I, I raised that arm. I remember, it, I said, it's not supposed to come out back there. And it didn't get very high. So I knew I'd pulled it out. So I just gritted my teeth, beginning to pray and retch and grabbed a bush. And I jerked that thing and popped it back in place. For the next three or four weeks, I, I went through, you know, quite a bit of pain. But God understood. God took care of us. But now I'm not telling you to do that because you may never do that. I remember one time covered up in a treetop, the skitter diver come down and said, I thought you'd be dead. I said, no, I'm very much alive, but I do have a horrible headache. You know, I had a knot on the head. I don't know where you remember. That's about, I'd been coming here about two years, about eight years ago. And I had a knot from here to here. I couldn't wear a hard hat for two weeks, but I'd raised my hands when I got up. I said, thank God I'm still alive. Because a small limb around two foot by, say, two and a half inches, from there on up is called widow makers. I just survived an entire treetop and lived to walk about it, walk about it, walk away from it. I saw other times tragedies and people wonder why you stay in that line of occupation. Well, you, you, you do and you hope that you can retire from it or reach a point you can get out of it. But I know it was a miracle from God that God kept me through all that and other tragedies in my life. So, I, I, you know, David refreshed himself when he came back from battle and his lieutenants all turned against him by the renewing of his mind, the renewing of his place in God. And there's times, and I've just told you about a few, that, and I could tell you about other greater tragedies, but yet I don't have to walk through them because I know at times some people think, well, Brother Ferris don't go through anything. Yes, Brother Ferris does, but I don't ponder on the valleys because I know on the ever side, other side of every deep valley I go through is another mountaintop, and that's what I'm going to focus my eyes on, and I'm going to journey through this life. Romans says not by feelings, but by faith. And we're going to have to learn to walk by faith. And I'll explain to you what America is needing in a moment. And that is a revival of faith. God wants you to be passionate in your worship because God wants to reverse that and God wants to give back unto you fellowship. You know, I, I, what really touches the heart of God? You, you should just ponder that sometime or other. And whenever you think about David, now we know his wife made light of him and, and, and lived under a curse. But when David learned how to worship God, I'm talking about truly worship God, you'll find in the Scriptures where the Bible says, and now, would God say this about us? David was a man, even as all his shortcomings, his affair with Bathsheba and all this and that, in all his shortcomings, he was a man or a woman, in your case, whatever gender you're in. He was a man after God's own heart. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you, am I, 
Are we a man or a woman after God's own heart? Here's God coming to the well, and he'd send his disciples away because he knew what they'd think. He, he, you're not supposed to be down here with the Samaritans, a half Gentile and half Jew, uh, uh, folks of that city. But he says to her, and she's almost a harlot, living with the, the fifth fellow she's been with, not married. He was showing her the intimacy with God of worship, of fellowship, how she could reach into a heart in a death that she'd never even thought possible to a degree that she'd never thirst again and never have husband number six or boyfriend number six because she would be satisfied by the words of this man from Galilee. Those words would spring up into her very belly and her very spirit and her very bosom the words of enlightenment, the words of her maker, the words of her creator, that she was made in her, in his likeness. She had had a horrible time in the flesh, like the little lady of the issue of blood, for years, but now she's met her Savior. And she said, come see a man that has told me all about myself. Come, she started revival because in her God had turned on a faucet of salvation. And he had given her an, a revelation a little bit about worship. And as you and I read those scriptures, they should produce in us and we should feel a stirring within her belly, within her spirit, the engulfing of the spirit of the Holy Ghost beginning to try to surface. And I know in our day, 36 or so years ago, when the enemy said, you're about to be sick, you're, you're going to bark here in this service, seven of us seeking God for the anointing and baptism or uh, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, but yet in just a few minutes I remember falling back. I was already down on my knees, so to speak, and I fell straight back, my legs under me, and when I came to, I was speaking in a heavenly language, and I thought to myself, who's doing the talking around here? Big mouth. I was the one praying. And I couldn't believe my, my spirit was talking to God. And I was so amazed and so high in the spirit realm. For days I walked around. I remember I probably had a case or so of booze left and a lot of other things around. And I just dumped all that out. I had a couple of friends that had got out of prison and all that. And I said, y'all, you know, a little later on, I said, y'all want these? I had a stack of country music albums that high. And I said, I'm, tear, I'm tired of hearing about the bottle that will let you down and my cheating heart to tell on you. I'm tired about hearing that. I've experienced the truth. And I have received a, a river of life in the, as an heir of salvation. And the Holy Ghost had begun to come into operation in my life. And he has John 14 uh, and 15 chapters says he began to be a teacher. And begin to give me revelation from the word of God. God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. But we're so dignified that we're afraid to get up here that God might lay upon our heart and we might get so happy, we might shout. You know, I think about my religious teaching when I was growing up. I think we went to church probably three or four times. You know, that's talking about from six to uh, uh, 18 or whenever I was at home. So I remember at an early age, around 12, I, I said, Mama, I said, uh, some of the kids at school is talking about uh, what they belong to, such and such church, like the Methodist and Presbyterian, Baptist, and this and that. I said, uh, do we have a religious preference, or I think they called it a faith. She said, yes, son. She said, on this side of the family, they Baptist. She said, on this side, they holiness. And she said, when they get together, they fight like cats and dogs. Great revelation, but it wasn't from the Word of God. But I remember then when I got about 19, that religious teaching, that, that's all I had. So I was 19 and in, inducted into the Army. I, that's the only lottery I ever won. And I got to go two-year vacation. And, and uh, they said, now, what do you want put on your dog tags in case you're you know, wounded and all this? We'll have that type chaplain or maybe killed come over you. You know, if you're Catholic, you have the life rights and stuff like that. I said, well, now... The best I remember 
I, I wouldn't say it, but I thought, now, that'd be awful. I come back in a body bag and transferred to a casket, and they're up there fighting over religion, the Baptists and the, the, the Hovenists. I said, you just put on there, I'm a Methodist. I didn't know what that meant, but that was all the religious teaching I had. But you know, when I found Jesus, and you can't love God, you can't love Jesus without loving his words because they was written to you, for you, and about you, and that's what will transform your life from a car carnal person because, you know, Romans teaches us that we got to, as in water baptism, the outward man is a dying daily process, that we've got to crucify those lusts, those desires, and our motivation and be fully blood purchased and to walk again as a new born again creature in God because Jesus went to that cross, paid the price. He was our escape goat there, took our sins to bring us back into the family tree and structure of God that we can begin to learn how by the renewing of our mind to walk in spirit and in truth and that will bring about as you give up your sacrifices from your lips of praise and God begins to accept that as you honor God and as you worship God and you exalt God, you, God's going to come into you in a new way, in a saturation that you'll feel that belly being ignited in a river flow of a move of the Holy Ghost. You know, so many of you sometimes come up here in prayer and you're so engulfed because the scripture says us we're, we're in the presence of the Lord there is liberty which means freedom and if you'll just come up here at times and begin to really worship God by raising your hands and showing surrenders and inviting the presence of God to come into your temple and your house, you're going to see the walls of Jericho, the walls of diseases, the walls of imprisonment, the walls of your past come crumbling down and God is going to invade in there and produce in your spirit a well that is going to become a river of living water and the joy is going to return to you. Some of you need that joy. Now, but yet we want church as norms so many times, and that won't cut it in these last days. That will not cut it. I remember years ago, this was over 30 years ago, when God spoke to us, and I'll, I'll touch on this maybe again in a moment. And it was something that I used to really make fun of in my early years of the ministry, and that's where a man might get up here and uh, would have some notes like I have right now and not rely on the anointing of God and, and would minister. So God brought me to eat those words. And there was other things that God would later on change. And one was 30-something years ago, God began to deal with us because I heard a, back then all the ministers really preached hard and quick and developed the preacher's hack. You've heard me talk about that before. But God said, I also want to give you on certain occasions, a, a, a different type of anointing. And he said, you'll never feel that office, but said, I want to give you a prophetic word, an anointing, an unction, to be able to speak at certain times as my Holy Ghost would give you an unction to speak. And you'll read something or say something in the Word that can speak life instantly to someone. And he said, I want that to be taught to my children, how to walk in a prophetic anointing for the day that's coming. Because I saw, in a way, 35 and ministered on it, didn't have a clue what I was talking about, the Mark of the Beast era that uh, Revelations talked about, how America would fall back then as a superpower. And that was because occasionally walking under prophetic anointing, I would begin to understand uh, uh, events that would happen from Ezekiel, Daniel, Revelations, and some of the up, uh, Matthew 24, and Luke, and some of those others, begin to put things together. And, you know, the last two or three years I see, and I'm going to get back on text, a socialistic type movement in America that's trying to get us to point towards socialism. Three things has got to happen for that to occur. First of all, you, you're going to have to uh, have universal health care. And I think some politicians uh, address that as Obamacare. 
And then you've got to have government take over of the banks, and we had the bailouts, but the third's not been done, the controlling of the food. And, you know, these things will lead us eventually into an America has, is declining rapidly, and the only thing that can save America is the church once again becoming a true lighthouse, no longer worried about being politically correct. And you talk about receiving persecution. When we stand up for the truth and we tell people the truth that we are shipwrecked because we have forgotten our morals and we have evolved into things that is carnality, and we allow atheists to teach in Christian schools, and we tell people that alternative lifestyle is not so bad, and that Big Brother is going to always take care of you, which is the government entitlement programs, we have drifted away from faith. America is in dire need of a revival of faith once again. You remember the disciples after the, I mean, they had really gotten saturated and saved uh, and really begin to follow Jesus. They, they brought in their deeds to their homes and their houses and their farms and they gave it to the disciples for the distributing of the needs of the people. Well, this was a, a, a seed that the, the church in this day and hour that we live in would later on take care of all the needs that would be taken care of by the entitlement programs but the church missed the bullet. We failed to walk in grace and we allow 70, 80 years ago entitlement programs to be evolved that we no longer say well if God don't touch me today preacher when you touch me with your finger I'm going to a doctor tomorrow because I've got health care. Good preaching. Why are y'all shouting so much? We've moved away from faith. I'm as guilty as anyone else. We've moved away from faith. We're needing people. And now here, at this point, when I was thinking about this, you know what I wanted to preach on? Marketing your talents. And, and Pastor Lowe and I thought, it's time. I'm going to preach on marketing your talents. And then about midstream, God said, I don't think so. I want you to teach on worship. You see, what did he say? How did, how did Jesus pray? Not my will, but thy will be done. In this earth as it is in, the, in heaven, the Lord's Prayer is so spiritual that we miss it. You know, I'm talking about touching the heart of God. Don't you or does that ever come across your mind? This little lady here, Samaritan lady, there's a revelation in this fourth chapter, 23rd verse. It said, God seeks such to worship him. This is God being intimate. And, you know, we'll go to our ball games and we'll hoop and we'll holler at the top of our lungs. We see these people protesting, these occupiers of Wall Street, Seattle, New York, whatever city they're in. We see them rioting. We see them uh, making great voice uh, sayings. We see them really speaking out, voicing their opinion before TV cameras and before uh, America. Yet we refuse to come into the house of God raise their hands in surrenderance unto him and saying, God, I'm here in this house today. I'm pushing through all my sickness, all my diseases, all my tribulation. I'm here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. You, we fail to understand how intimate God wants us to become with him. Now, I know I've been a little rough. That's a little bit of an evangelistic work that occasionally God calls us to do. Because God wants our minds, carnality minds, crucified so that we can have our spirit mind once again renewed by the Word. And what did John say? The truth shall set you free. And when that engrafted Word becomes law, rooted and grounded, tried in the fire of your tribulations and your testes, then that will begin to minister a prophetic anointing in your life that as it was with our daughter back there just a few weeks ago where three different doctors had failed to find the problem 
and all they know to do is give her strong antibiotics, but when she got sick and tired of the pain and the suffering, and she fell to her knees and told God, even in a blunt way, she received that victory. But here we are. We're still in that religious mode. And we come up here and say, it's, it's me, God. I got a need. I'm begging you. Can you hear me? Answer me right back soon. Honey, you got to take it by force. Since the days of John the Baptist to now, the enemy is your adversary. He's going to wage war against you. He's going to do everything in his power to destroy you. What did John 10, 10 say? He come to destroy, to rob and to steal and to cheat and he's doing that real good and we fall under that and we don't arm ourselves with the full armor of God, allow the word of God to flow through our belly and to use that word as a sword and that faith from that word appear as a shield and we speak as I miraculously did when I called that seed and I wasn't even aware of it. But I said, God, allow that seed on this debt elimination, that first installment, that, that, that gift be to her healing. And in a matter of a week and a half, she received that healing. God is so good. And I remember my dad, he, he became the eldest in his family because his older brother at nine-year-old, he, he passed away. So he became the eldest. And so... When I was born, my grandmother, his mother, which was holiness, and, and my other grandmother was, was Baptist, but she was present when I was born, and I, I thank God every day for that because I never understood it till mom passed away. She'd often try to tell me, and I've told this so, scores of time. But here I was, second born to my dad mom, son, two girls follow us, but I'm bridge birth. And I can't breathe. Do I was born at home. Dr. Thomas tried to get everything he could for about five minutes. And my grandmother was sitting there with a pan of warm water. And all he, the doctor could say was when I was passed off, Mom said to the, my Sudi, my, my grandmother, a little Pentecostal Jesus name, tongue-talking grandmother, knowed how to bombard heaven and do battle with the devil and shake her fist in his eyes and his face. This little boy's not breathing. The doctor's words was this. I cannot save them both. I'm the mom's bleeding bad. I'm going to try my best to save her. And she took that pen of warm water and invoked the power that comes behind that name that is Buddha? Harry Kishner? I, I told you I don't have my belt on. What is his name? Jesus, and she began to say, God, I lost my firstborn, and this is my secondborn grandson, and I'm not giving him up. I declare he's going to breathe. I have no doubt this is some type of word, she said, because I begin to spit and become the meanest little boy they ever had in their life. Meaner than all of them, I become the black sheep of the family. Yeah, only one that ever had a, a vacation. <laughs> but you wasn't the officer in charge. And you know, I, I, I got three Article 15s in the service, and, but I was a good kid, but sin had control of me. It slew me. But then I met this man called Jesus. Because see, my little grandmother done put an anointing on my life. You don't know, grandparents, how important it is when you dedicate those children. For the next 14 years, I can remember angels visiting me. I was unsaved. I would wreck automobiles, Sometimes try to find my home so intoxicated, but I'd always survived, always survived because that little grandmother had prayed over me and dedicated me to God. No matter how far away from God I got, the angel would always bring me home. I remember waking up a time or two at night and in the bedroom still at home as a young man did out and did all kind of things and your conscience convicting you something awful and I'd lay down and something would sit on the bed beside me and I'd ease the pillow out of under my head real quick and I'd throw it in that direction, jump up, turn the light on, nothing there. <clears throat> Losing it. But later on I realized it was my guardian angel. Through the prayer of my little grandmother in inheritance, see she learned they grew up back in those days right after the Depression and a few years afterwards what hard times was. America don't know faith. They may have went hungry 
a lot of times, but my grandmother knew how to pray grace over a meal and no doubt see it increased. We need people who knows how to get a host of God today. We need worshipers who can, when people come into the house of God and they got a need, I'm talking about pressing through, not just bringing a petition to God. God knows the desires of your heart. God knows the walls that's folding in on your life. God wants you to learn how to worship him in the midst of the fire so that he can prove and be like he was to the three Hebrew children. They said we cast three in that fire, but why is it now I see a fourth man in there with them walking around and they're no longer tied. They're free. Because they said, oh, king, this far may take her life, but we want you to know who's on the throne, basically the throne of her heart. They was going to worship and praise God to the end, but guess what happened? God delivered them. Can God lie? God can't lie. So if God delivered them, God is no longer a respecter person. God has to do the same thing for you. My Bible says that we are a peculiar people. Wait, maybe he said we was cold and frigid and we just sat around, never smiled, never worshiped God. Preacher gets on her toes. We say, well, he did a pretty good job, but he's gone to meddling now. <laughs> Amen or oh me. You know, I see the sick, needy, the diseased, imprisoned folk, and they're not free. They don't have that walk into liberty. They're still caught up in bondage. And God's warning to today to open a spiritual door into us through our worship. You don't know how important it is to get in one mind, one accord with God. And worship Him from the bottom of your heart and be serious. I'm talking about so serious if God impresses upon you, you might shout. You may even speak in an unknown language. But you learn how to worship God and that with a lip service, but with lip sacrifices. Because, you know, Jesus fulfilled the law, but he didn't do away with sacrifices. He no longer wants the, the blood of animals to be shed. He shed his blood for us, but now he wants us to sacrifice the praises, no matter how you feel, to worship him as King of kings and Lord of lords. I dare you this day to get free in the liberty and the freedom that's in the Holy Ghost and in God and allow him the Bible says God wants to inhabit the praises of his people, but we want praise him. Why can't we surrender unto him? Why can't we learn to exalt him? Why can't we learn how to uh, uh, wait upon him and begin to start to ball? As I said earlier, and this, this really bears up on me, why can't we say, God, here am I, use me, and I'm expected to be used as we was years ago. How that I felt a... a, a, a a curse from the enemy because I had a, a speech impairment, you might say, but yet the Holy Ghost called us to, to do a work in these last days, and that's to be a brother and sister. And so many times, you don't know what it is for when folks come in those doors and they're hurting. I mean, they're going through something, and you just go back there and you just love them. You know, the first thing they see is the elder use its hard shaking their hands, grinning from ear to ear, and then Anna or somebody else will just let them know, you're loving them. You know, God is love. That's the compassion of God. But then when someone who can learn to really, I'm talking about walking in a realm, in the spirit realm, and God will give you a prophetic word. And I saw a, a time just a few weeks back, a young lady saying back here, don't think she's here today, but I said, I see two things in behind you and I said this is something God showed us and it doesn't work all the time I, I don't operate in that office but I said I see behind you I see hurt and abuse and the reason we saw it that way was that was in her past and her past that hurt and that abuse was she had a feeling of worthlessness now for hundreds and thousands of years we still are prejudiced, especially in the church realm, and that's toward the female gender. You know, a son is born, we get ecstatic, and we all that, and a daughter's born, we don't get that happy. 
we've always give more attention and more favor to the boy babies than we would the girl babies. And a lot of people, ladies, that's why they learned to be such great servants because they used to be the helper. And I guess that was part of the curse of Genesis, the helper to the husband. And they assumed that role so greatly and they become the greatest prayer warriors because we as men go around stuck up and become male chauvinists. Now, ladies, you should have shouted there. Okay. And, and you know, I, I didn't notice this so much. Now, my sister taught me that. She said, you wasn't born to girl. I said, no. And she said, you know, you don't know what it's like. I said, Dad always praised the boys, but said nothing we ever done. And, you know, that just cut me to the bone. I thought, how we favor little boys over little girls. And I remember years ago preaching in a little Pentecostal hole in this church. And I preached against the sin of Barbie doll. Because, you know, after you have a baby or two and you get the middle age spread, you won't look like Barbie no more. I'm sorry. And I said, that hurts her feelings, and we develop a conflict. And we feel like we've been violated, that God no longer loves us, and people pick on us because I'm fat. Well, I can diet, but you're just stupid and ugly. What are you going to do? Huh? Because you, you, you don't see that God made me this way. Now, that's being jokingly, but God loves you just as you are. He, he knows every hair on her head. Now, Larry, I'm not talking to you, brother. He knows every hair on her head, and he loves us that way. Amen? He loves Larry just the way he is. He loves Todd just the way he is. He loves you just the way you are. But sometimes you feel, because you're a girl, I'm not as important as Jeremy and Dwayne because I'm a girl. You bore the next generation of the lows in ministry. You was the chosen vessel. They just called into a ministry office, but you was given a much higher power. You see, we all have talents. We don't know how they may happen in tragedy. Through a, a rape, someone might birth the next genius or something like that. You see, you're important, but you're going to have to develop relationship. Now, last year we taught on Fellowship, relationship, and partnership. This is a continuation. Worship. Could we come up? Let's get some singers up here. Let's worship. I love that song they sang, even if the mic wasn't turned on. A while ago, about that offering. God will give back to you, pressed down, shaken over. I'd like to see some folk in here for the next two or three minutes. I mean worship God. Get excited about your... I'd like to see somebody press through, touch the throne of God to that God turns back the anointing and in and out of your belly comes a flow of the Holy Ghost in such a way He changes your English tongue. You move into the Holy Ghost realm and whatever defect you might have in the body, God recreates that and gives you a new arm or a new pancreas that is no long, now no longer needs the pill or a shot of insulin. He, he can recreate that. He can do your miracle if you'll touch Him with the sacrifices of your praises this morning. So let's come up front and worship God this morning as they sing. Sacrifice of praise into the house of the, of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you. The sacrifices of joy They bring the sacrifice of praise Into the house of the Lord We bring the sacrifice of praise Into the house of the Lord And we offer up to you The sacrifices This is the day, the 
Now remember this week, service is coming up in the next night or two. And of course, Wednesday night service, 
But remember these needs that were spoken of earlier from Pastor Lowe to those that lost loved ones, those that's going through some things. You know, we're not going through them, but we should be their helper and hold them up in this. And we know what the Holy Ghost is in time like this. He's the comforter. So let's be dismissed in this prayer and God bless you and go with you this morning. Father, we ask that you be with Pastor Lowe this week. Those who suffered a great hardship of loss, encourage their hearts and let them know God, that one day we're going to stand once again reunited with any family member that's ever gone on or anything like that. Bless these upcoming services. Bless this congregation as well as the other services that may be dismissing in this county at this time. Go with this great, wonderful group of people and bring about joy and liberty in their life this week as they meditate on the Word. And we dismiss them in that mighty name of Jesus. God bless you.